Hello and welcome to Practical Python with Joe Perry, a brand new course here on Udemy focused on teaching Python the way you learn. Speaking of which, why do you want to learn? If it's because you want to be a super hacker or take over the internet or write world-class chatbots, this may or may not be the class for you. If on the other hand, it's because Python is useful and it seems like it'd be fun to know, you're in the right place. Why do you want to learn it from me? Why this class? Why this instructor? Well, this is who I am. I'm Joseph Perry. I'm a professional cybersecurity instructor and cybersecurity consultant. I formerly worked at a company called Cybrary, where I was the director of research. And I've also worked at the National Security Agency, where among other tasks, I was a CNO tool developer and a research and development engineer. I was in the United States Navy. If you've seen my classes before, I've told many stories about it, uh, where I worked in research and development. I've worked across the cybersecurity and IT worlds, but those are the jobs that are most relevant to what I'm teaching here. And I have a lot of time spent writing Python on not just to perform complicated computer science tasks, but to do what we're here to do in this class, which is just use it to make my day-to-day -day life easier. Why do you want to learn it with this course? Well, because it's a dead sprint introduction. The whole class is as short as I could make it while still making sure you would truly understand the concepts we introduce. Also because it's focused on understanding the core ideas and applying them critically. We're going to have basic concepts introduced to us and then exercises given that will allow us to expand on those ideas and even introduce new paradigms to them. So the videos aren't the full exhaustive part of this course by design. Instead, they help you get started and guide you through the process of performing these exercises and building these core ideas. This is all about giving you the tools to learn. If you've ever seen the old school hacker videos on YouTube where people first taught you how to use Kali Linux with some bad pop song that they had poorly remastered in the background and no dialogue, this takes a little bit of inspiration from that, but with, you know, a decade of teaching experience behind it, adding a little bit more structure and humanity to the process. But the key here is that when I was learning programming, when I was first coming up, I didn't learn truth tables or regular expressions or specific APIs. I learned how to learn programming by watching other people do it on the job and by listening to them explain their work as they went. And that's what this is all about. Rather than trying to get that didactic school feeling again, it's about replicating the feeling of on-the-job training, where you're just getting introduced to the concepts as you need them to do your job successfully and to use your tools right. Each section is specifically designed to help you get into that mindset so section one, you want to write a hello world. Section two, you want to learn how to deal with data and numbers and do math in Python. Section three, you want to combine the concepts of the first two sections in order to get out of some paperwork. There will be exercises along the way that help you see how you can expand on these ideas outward, but the video courses and the lessons themselves are all focused around accomplishing specific tasks using Python programming. And so to do that, we introduce the concepts very practically, very simply, and very briefly so that you can explore them on your own time and with a good sense of how they fit into the greater picture. How will each of these work? How will you learn Python? Well, the same concepts that you would be learning in a traditional Python class will still be present here. As we go through the process of writing Hello World, downloading and installing Python, we'll touch on the concepts of strings and functions, variables and input output, some of which are happening much earlier than they normally would in a Python programming course, but they are happening as we're introduced to them. Once we're done with that, we start dealing with data. We'll learn about numbers, lists and dictionaries and flow control. We'll get once again introduced to functions at a deeper level this time and understand how we can create our own, but we'll take all of the concepts that we've been learning and apply them to new types of data or new quantities of data. And then once that's done, we'll take everything that we've been studying, all the logic and the flow control and the variable types and all the general concepts that we've been using in very simple ways, and we'll combine them all at once to do what seems like a complicated task very, very easily. And we'll do that with file handling and manipulating data, understanding how we can read and write from files and how we can change the data we find there to perform our tasks. And that'll be it. So why is this a better way to learn? Why is it better to do this rather than sitting in front of a PowerPoint? Well, for most people, programming is a very technical skill set. It's not something that they're trying to get their PhD in or write a thesis about or perform some really technical task. They're really in it to get another tool in their belt. And we don't learn skills like that. We don't learn usable skills like that robotically. We don't learn them didactically. We learn them by watching other people do it. You learn how to repair a car by watching someone who knows how to repair a car do it while they talk you through the steps. And then you go off and you experiment on your own with an engine that is a little bit less valuable. And of course, the value for a lot of people, this is gonna be the last time you have to sit and stare at a bunch of slides. There are no more slides in this course from here on out. It's me talking over the actual code that I'm writing and you can see it being used practically on screen. Final question and with great credit to Always Sunny in Philadelphia, uh, what do now? Well, now we get started and we learn how to use Python practically to solve real tasks and how we can get the tools we need to build our own knowledge.
In my admittedly rarely humble opinion, it's not really possible to start writing a Python program until you have first installed Python. Of course, that's where we're going to start in this lesson. Very first step is how to install Python on a Windows 10 system, and it's actually pretty easy. So you can see here the very first page I already have open is the Microsoft Store. And the Microsoft Store, if you just go into it and search for Python 3, as you can see I have up here at the top, it'll take you to this page. You can see here you just have the installation. It's worth noting it says here that I already own the app it is not an app for purchase. It's completely free. That's just a quirk of the Windows Store. I hit install. It downloads. It generally does not actually take very long to download so long as you have a decent connection. You can see here it's only about 33 megs of code total for the download for the Python interpreter. And we are just about done. Bam. Product installed. Nice and easy. Now that's the easiest way to install Python 3.8 on a Windows system, but it's not the only way. And I do want to take a second to address the other method. Here on the python.org page, you can see we have a bunch of important tabs. The about page, where you could learn all the details about Python and Guido Van Rossum and all the history and structure of the language. Here, the downloads page, where we're going to go, you can see our very top, it identifies that we're on a Windows system, and our first button here is download python 3.8.2. That downloads a Windows installer, as you would do with any other Windows installer. You agree to run it, it runs, and it's installed just as painlessly as you saw before. While we're here on the site, I'm going to, for the first time of many, plug the Python documentation. Here you can see the Python docs, one of the most important resources for any Python programmer in the entire world. I still refer to these all the time, absolutely essential tools. In here you have not only Python tutorials and Python beginner's guides, there are also lists of periodicals and books that you can reference, pep index so that you can actually see the rules of the language, as well as specific resources on library references and tutorials, where you can see in our library references that we'll spend a lot of time talking about later. All of the different tools that you can access with Python have their own help documentation so that you're never lost and alone trying to figure out what to do. That's one of the most wonderful things about Python is how well documented and how extremely diverse the crowd is that works on it, which means that it has tons of resources from millions of people in dozens of industries. And that, of course, is one of the many reasons this is a language worth learning. So those are the two easiest ways to install Python 3 on your Windows 10 system. Of course, there are going to be challenges if you're working with other systems. If you're working with Linux or Mac, well, most Linux distributions and Mac, you can see they have basic downloads for those, um, but it's going to be a little bit more specific according to your operating system. That said, this class is focusing on Windows, and so is this video. Join us in the next one where we see how we can actually create Python files and start Start executing code. So we want to write a hello world, and we want to do it right. And of course, if we want to write any Python code, we have to make sure that Python can actually run whatever it is we write. To do that, we need to create a file that the Python interpreter will know is Python, and that Windows will know to give to the Python interpreter. To perform that task is actually pretty easy. All you have to do to create a Python file is open up whatever your favorite text editor might be. It might be Vim, might be Emacs. If you live in the modern era, it might be Notepad++ or something a little bit even more modern than that. I am not terribly modern in terms of text editors. I love Notepad++ mostly because it's easy to zoom. So I have Notepad++ open to create my Python file. All I'm going to do is hit File, Save As, and then give it a name. Since we're writing Hello world, it seems appropriate that I'll name it hello world.py. And then you save that, and now you have a Python file. Now, of course, this Python file doesn't actually run any code. It's not performing anything yet, but it is a Python file that can now be read by Python. Let's take the next step then. How do we actually write hello world? Well, the simplest way is simply by telling Python to print it. Now, in the old days, in the early days, the dark days, if you wanted Python to print something, you would simply write the word print and then you would, in quotes, write whatever you wanted it to print. But the thing is, for a lot of reasons that we're not gonna dig into right now, that creates a ton of bad habits and problems when you start writing code in large scale. What we're gonna do here is just use print the way it was meant to be written which is with parentheses next to it. These parentheses are indicating to Python that this print is an action. We call it a function. And all you really need to understand about functions at the very beginning is that a function is a black box that you give some piece of input and it takes that input and performs a task with it. Sometimes that task will be to give you something back. Sometimes that task will be to change that data or simply to make a decision based on that data. All that matters when we're talking about functions is that it is a section of code that is going to take some sort of information and perform a task on it. So in this case, for our print statement, with our parentheses next to it, what those indicate are everything inside of these parentheses is the data meant for that print statement. So if we want to print something to the screen using this print function in Python, then we put whatever it is we want it to say inside these parentheses. In this case, 
what we're going to put in it in quotes is hello world. Now the reason it's in quotes is because in Python, you have to have a way of distinguishing between strings and commands. If we had print in quotes here, then print wouldn't be understood as a function. Instead, it would be understood as just some text to be read. And so for Python to know the difference between code that it should execute and words that it should read as words, we just use quotes. Now you can use double quotes and you can use single quotes, and there are some tricks to those that we'll play with a little bit later on when we dig deeper into strings. But at its most basic level, a string is simply defined as a series of characters inside of quotes. And with that information, we now understand that we are taking this string, the string that says hello world, and we are using that as the data that we are feeding into the black box that is our print function. What does that actually do? The thing is that in any language, including Python, the only way you can really find out what your code is doing is to run it. So here you can see I've saved my file now, I've just got this print hello world statement, and all we really know right now is that hello world is a string and print is a function. And we kind of understand vaguely what those two things mean. Let's see what that allows us to do. So I've just opened my command prompt and you can see I'm just open to a basic prompt. I don't have any administrator privileges and I'll increase the font through the magic of editing. So with our font increase, now what we want to do is we want to navigate to wherever our Python file is saved. And up here at the very top, you can see that it's saved in my OneDrive documents Python. So we're going to CD. This isn't a Windows class, so we're not going to spend too much time talking about these commands. But CD means change directory. And we're going to go to OneDrive. And then we're going to hit this slash right here. We're going to tab until we see document. We're going to hit that slash again. We're going to type Python, Python with a T. And we're going to hit enter. And if we typed everything incorrectly, it will move us to this directory. If we didn't type something incorrectly, then we just need to double check our command and rerun it. We of course need to make sure that wherever we're trying to navigate to is on your system where you just saved your Python file. With that done, now all we have to do is type Python 3 and we can hit tab and it will complete the name of our program. So Python 3 hello world.py. We know that it's got a function called print, which is a black box that takes a string containing hello world and does something with it. And what it does with it is print it to the screen. Congratulations, you've now written a hello world program. We're gonna have a little bit more detail about strings below and you're going to get to spend a little bit more time on it in our next video where we see how we can print something more substantial than just a hello world. So please join us next where we talk about variables and input output. So we've successfully written a hello world, and that would seem as though our job is completely done. But the thing is that as we were writing it, we were introduced to a couple of ideas that we want to play around with a little bit more, because hey, maybe this hello world thing can be a little bit more robust, a little bit more interesting. How would we go about, say, saying hello to a specific person? In this video, we're going to talk all about input, output, and variables. So let's start with variables. First things first, in our last video, we created a print statement print hello world. And we understood, as we save this to a new Python file, which we're going to call hello you. Py. Now we understood when we ran this code before that this is just a string, which is just text that Python knows not to interpret as code. And we put that inside these parentheses so that the function print will know what to print. But what if we wanted to print something that might change? What if we wanted a print statement that could adjust? What if we wanted to say hello to any number of people? To do that, we would want to make use of variables. So the first thing that we might have is a variable that we're going to call our first string. One of the most important rules of variables is they can't have any spaces in their name. So when you're naming a variable, typical convention is to use underscores rather than spaces. And there are a lot of coding conventions that differ, and Python actually has some specific peps, including pep8, that are absolutely fascinating when discussing how you should go about writing Python. But those are a little bit more theoretically focused, and in this, we're more focused on Python as a tool. So in this case, we're just going to say our first string with underscores to keep the words together. Now to create a variable, we're going to use an equal sign, and the idea is that we are telling Python this series of characters, which you note are not enclosed in quotes, unlike a string, this series of characters is a box. It's a container for information, and the information that we want to put in it can be found on the other side of this equal sign. So you can think of the equal sign as a sort of conveyor belt, taking all of the information that's on the right side and putting it into the left. And the kind of variable we're going to create in this case is going to be a string variable. Since we understand strings already, we understand the idea of a box with a string inside of it pretty easily. So that's what we're going to do here. And in this case, we're going to only put part of 
our string. Instead of just writing the full hello world, we're going to write hello, comma, space. Because what we're trying to do in this program is say hello to individuals. And to perform that task, we have to have a string that doesn't complete everything. We have to add something to it, after all. So our first string is just going to say hello. Now to get the person's name that we're going to write back to, we have to accept some kind of input. Now in old school programming languages, this could be an absolute nightmare, trying to format your input strings and understand the concept of the input variables, and we don't have to worry about really any of that. In Python, all we need to do is type our second string equals input. And you can see here we have a new function. Now what's great about Notepad++ in particular is you can see here it starts giving me information about what this function is and what information it takes. Now we're not going to dig into these concepts just yet, but we can see that next to input it says the word prompt. And let's look at what that actually means for us. In this case, it's going to be a string. In most cases for input, it's going to be a string. It's going to be pretty upset with you if you try not to give it a string. What is your name. And then we're going to put a space at the end. Now what input does is it actually performs that print action we saw earlier and then waits for an answer. So here it will write this string that we've just given it to the screen because it understands that that's the data that we are giving to it. But remember that functions are black boxes and some of these black boxes will produce something new. And so that's why we've put input on the right side of this equal sign for this string. Because what we're doing is we're, we're saying, hey input, this is the data that I'm giving you. Use that data to do whatever it is is that input does. And then when you're done and you have the information to give to me, put that information into this string. And that's all we're talking about when you hear programmers use the phrase return value. It's just the information given back to us by a function after it's done running. And we can often store that information in variables so that it's easier to access. Having performed this task, we now theoretically will have two strings. The first string is that hello that we wrote hard coded into our program. And the second will be whatever input gets back from the user. Now, of course, to print these to the screen, we want to make use of that same function we used in our last video in order to print. But we're going to have to do something a little bit different, because now we have two strings. And this is one of the great things about Python, is that when you're trying to use strings, you can do something called string concatenation. And that's a very, very technical, very impressive term to sum up this. Really just string addition. It's saying take the first string, and when you get to the end of that string, add the contents of the second string. And since we're using variables to this print statement, what print understands as a function is that the the data it wants isn't these variables since they aren't in quotes, but instead the data inside or the strings inside. And so it's going to look in each of these variables and find the string, and when it gets to the end of the first string, it will write the second. And we can see that in action pretty easily by going back to our command prompt, and this time typing python3 hello you.py. And when we run it, you can see it prints to the screen, what is your name? In this case, of course, my name is Joe, and I type Joe. And it says, hello, Joe. Our program successfully works. Now we can see that if we run this with a fake name, it will just say, hello, fake name. And that's what the variable is actually here for, is if we don't know what we want to print when we first write our code, if we want to print something that we can't predict, then we have to create some variable, some place to hold information, so that when that information comes from our input function, we have a place to put it. So that's how you print with multiple strings and input output using variables. Three concepts that would normally be very, very difficult are actually really easy in Python and really easy to hang with so long as you understand that we're just dealing with fancy boxes. That's the end of this video, and in fact, that's already the end of this very first section. You have not only successfully written Hello World, but you now know how to deal with input and output, and that is a great place to start. In our next section, we're going to learn about dealing with data. We're going to learn about numbers and math in Python, and we're going to learn about how to deal with a bunch of variables at the same time. Join us in Practical Python. If we want to understand how to handle data in Python, the first thing we have to understand is how to handle numbers. So to start, I've written out a few simple variables that we can work with. The first variable, num1, is simply the number 10. And if you remember from our last section, all a variable really is is just a box we're putting data in. So in this case, that data is the number 10, and the box is labeled num1. Num2 is containing the number 20. And then you can see down here, I have a bunch of other variables that I haven't actually given values to yet. So if I tried to run this Python code, it actually would not work. And we can see that in the flesh, if I were to type Python 3, well, not 4, Python 3 numbers, and you can see we have a syntax error, invalid syntax. So this is one of the first and most important errors you're going to find in Python. If you see a Python error that says syntax error, that means that you have broken the rules of the language. 
in some way. And you can see specifics above that where it says in line four and it has a little arrow pointing to where I have failed to define my variable. So if your code is failing and you're getting syntax errors, that means you've broken the rules of the language, which I in fact have just done. So add res, which is the variable in which I want to put the result of addition in Python. To do that, of course, I have to perform some addition in Python. Well, I don't know how you learned addition, but the way I learned it was pretty straightforward. We just use a plus sign. So if I wanted to add 10 plus 20 and store the result in add res, I could do it like that, but we are using programming right now and we did just define variables or just create boxes with those numbers in them. It seems a waste not to use them. So instead we might say num1 plus num2 and store that result in add res. Now, a lot of people get a little bit hung up on this one because of equations they're usually used to solving will start with the equation on this side followed by the equal sign and the result on the right side. This is just the reverse of that because what we're doing is we're saying whatever the outcome of these things is, put it on the conveyor belt that is our equal sign and store it in this variable. Sub res, subtraction result, we can perform in a very similar fashion. Num1 minus num2. Now, astute observers will notice that I have a 10 and a 20, which means num1 minus num2 is going to be a negative number. The great thing about Python is you don't really need to do any adjustment for that. For the kind of numbers you're handling on a day-to-day -day basis, Python will take care of that for you. The next variable is mole res, so multiplication result, and we're going to put num1 times num2. The asterisk in this case is going to be our multiplication sign because, of course, x is a letter, which means it's either going to be a string or part of code most of the time. And then div res or division result num1 divided by num2. Now again, you'll notice that 10 is smaller than 20, and the result of that is going to be something that we want to observe. So first we're going to create our first print statement, which is just going to be print add res. Then print sub res, and you can probably complete the pattern from there. Having run those four functions, and again, remember that all we're doing is we're saying, hey, print process, whatever it is you do to make text go to the screen, do it with the contents of the add res variable. Now you'll note that we're using numbers now rather than strings, and in a lot of languages that would create a huge hassle here. But if you're only printing numbers or only printing strings, Python has no trouble handling that. And we'll see in a little while how you can deal with printing numbers and strings at the same time. But here we have print add res, sub res, mole res, and div res, in order and we can see what that looks like by running our code and here you can see our results the result of addition 30 makes sense 10 plus 20 the result of subtraction negative 10 again that tracks 10 minus 20 200 10 times 20 and 0 0.5 now you'll notice that none of these other numbers have a decimal place this is a special kind of number called a float and you don't really need to know the details of how floats are different from integers other than to say that floats are how python handles decimals and fractions so if you're trying to deal with something that's smaller than one or less than a full part of one it's going to be using a float so that's how you do basic math in python that's how you use variables to perform Form that math and that's how you print the results. In our next video what we're going to approach is dealing with large numbers of variables at the same time and we're going to do that using lists and dictionaries. In our last video, we saw how we can do some basic math in Python. In this video, we're going to see how we can deal with large numbers of variables or larger data sets all at once by using lists and dictionaries. And this video is going to help us lead into our next and final video of handling data, where we talk about the actual logic of programming and we learn how to write fully fledged programs. To get there, we first need to understand how lists and dictionaries work. So we might first create a variable that we're going to call our first list. And when we're creating lists, we define those in a special way. If you remember that what's on the right side goes over the conveyor belt of our equal sign into the left side, one of the things that Python will allow us to do is tell that conveyor belt, hey, this information should be stored as a list. And the way we do that is by storing that information in square brackets. You may remember earlier when we wanted to print, we used parentheses. Well, when we're creating lists, we use square brackets. Now square brackets, again, indicate that the data that is present inside is a list. But what data might that be? Well, that's one of the other really awesome things about Python. It can be pretty much whatever you imagine. So a list in Python might contain a series of numbers. It might contain a series of strings, each enclosed in their own set of double quotes to indicate to Python that these are different strings. Or even more impressively, it could contain other lists. 
and we can test what each of these is by printing them out. So we have three print statements, each of them for each of these lists we just created. Now we can see that the way we actually created each of these lists was just by putting whatever the data set we wanted to be stored inside with parentheses or with commas between them. Forgot what commas were called for a moment. If that data is strings, then we can use it like this, where we have strings in their own individual double quotes separated by commas. So let's print these three list types out and I've named this file lists.pot, and when we run it, you can see that it prints out with those square brackets. So those square brackets are indicating that what was printed was a list, rather than the contents of that list being printed individually. So here you can see one, two, three, four, five is our first list. A, B, C, D, even though these are now in single quotes, are still strings. Remember that strings can be either single quotes or double quotes. It's just preferable that you use the same convention throughout your code. And here you can see that our final list contained our first list and our second list in their own set of brackets, indicating that those are in fact list type variables. So before we get too confused by this, all we have to understand is that list variables are just big variables that contain arrays of data. They contain lots of pieces of information that can be stored together. The final thing that we want to note about lists before we go is that lists aren't picky about type. So we might say our multi-type list and have one a our first list. And that will work just fine, if I can type it correctly. And you can see here down at the bottom, our newest list, which has a number, a string, and a list. Python's not picky about that. So now we understand lists, fair enough, pretty easy. What's our next topic? Dictionaries. And the reason why we're doing these in the same video is because lists and dictionaries are inextricably intertwined in the way Python works. But when we're talking about them from a functional standpoint, the thing to understand about dictionaries is that one, when you define them, you use a new type of bracket. And those are the curly braces. And you can see that those are just right above the square bracket on most English uh, keyboards, but those indicate that variable we are creating now is a dictionary. So inside of these curly brackets, we can now put our dictionary. But what actually is a dictionary? Well, we can think of it just like you would think of a normal dictionary, where you have a set of values or words that you look up, and each of those words has tied to it a definition. And that definition is what that word maps to. So when we're creating a dictionary, we can think of it in a very similar way. We have our key, which is the first object, and then we have a colon which indicates what that object is defined to or what it maps to in that dictionary. So in this case we might say that one maps to apple. Now just like lists, dictionaries aren't terribly picky about how these things map. You can see that there we just used a number to a string. Here we might use a string to a number. However we can't use other dictionaries or other lists as keys. Dictionaries require that your keys be something that can be hashed, or basically a single discrete value that the dictionary can easily understand. So numbers and strings are usually going to be the safest places to go for that. So here we can see, again, one is to apple, apple is to two, and I'm going to change that so that there's no confusion as we start printing it. So instead, banana is to two. So one maps to the string apple, and banana maps to the string two, but how do we address those? How do we actually use those? With dictionaries, it's very simply done with square brackets. Now you may remember square brackets from lists and you'll find as you start working with lists and dictionaries more as well as strings that square brackets will actually come up a lot. When we're using them in reference to a dictionary, what we are saying is whatever the information is inside of these square brackets, don't use it to create a new list, which is what it would do if it was on the other side of an equal sign. But if it's right next to it with no spaces between it, look for the value that you find in these brackets. And as before, we can very simply tell it to print whatever the result of that is by wrapping it in those parentheses and putting a print before it. And so now what we are telling our code to do is look up the number one in your keys or your search terms for your dictionary and whatever maps to that in that dictionary, which in this case is going to be Apple, print it. And we can see the same thing work using a string as our key, so long as the string exactly matches the original string that was created. And now we'll run this code and see this dictionary at work. And here you can see that it printed out Apple and it printed out two because it successfully looked up these two values in the dictionary. Now, this obviously is just a basic introduction to the concepts of lists and dictionaries. We're going to use them as we go forward in handling data and then in our third section where we tie everything together to perform an actual Python task. But to get to there, we have to understand the tools that we're using and one of those tools is dictionaries. Join us in our next video where we are going to talk all about the logic of programming and defining our own functions to perform tasks.
In our previous videos, we've explored a bunch of different variable types, a bunch of different ways we can capture information. We understand how strings and numbers are represented. We understand how to do math. We understand the idea of combining strings with the addition sign called string concatenation. We understand the sort of general basics of these variables, but we don't really know how to make decisions with them yet. We don't really know how to do anything programming like with them. And this video is going to address that. So to start out, our very first consideration when we're talking about programming logic is the classic if statement. And the classic if statement is all about making a simple decision decision based on a single true or false value, something that we call a Boolean value. So in this case, we might say if var1 is greater than var2, print var1. Now, there are some specific things that we want to address in what I just wrote, because obviously this looks a little bit different from what we've been doing so far. First, we have our if statement. Now, you'll note that print as a function uses parentheses to mark its arguments or the variables or pieces of information that it's working with. However, for our if statement, for our logical statements, it doesn't do that because it's not actually a function. Instead, it's a key word. So in this case, this if statement is evaluating everything between it and the next colon it sees on the same line. So here you can see that this colon indicates the end of our if statement. Everything inside of it, which is what is highlighted on the screen now, is what is being evaluated. So in this case, we are saying is variable one or var one greater than var2. Now, of course, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that we've not created those variables yet. There's nothing in them, so it's kind of an empty question. But variables exist specifically so that we can fill them with new information. So, first step, var1 equals input. And in this case, we're going to say, give me a number. Now, you'll remember from our video where we were doing output by getting usernames and printing hello to them, that we could combine strings with plus signs. The reason we could do that with input in particular is because of the fact that Python interprets all input from the command as a string. So if we want to make that input usable as a number for our comparison down below, we have to perform one other function. And we're going to write that on the next line so that it's a little bit easier to read. We're going to say var1 equals int var1. Now you can see a huge bunch of information popped up down below when I started writing that. We're not going to read all of that on this screen. What that was telling us is that the purpose of the int function, which we can see is just a different function from input or print or what have you, all this does is it takes whatever the variable we give it, and if that variable can be understood as a number, it redefines it as one. So what happens here, what you can imagine this actually doing is that the character of one, for example, is being turned into the number one. That's all the int function is actually really doing. So we have converted our integer from a string and we want to get a second number. So we'll say var2 equals input give me a second number and var2 equals int var2. So we now have our logical comparison between these two variables that makes some kind of sense. The user is going to give us two numbers and we are going to figure out which one's bigger. If var1 is the bigger number, we are going to print it. Now you'll notice that this print is indented. It's inside or it's further in than the if statement above it. And in fact, on notepad++, you'll probably notice this little red square next to it that allows me to collapse that code. Python is a language that is white space delimited. What that means is that Python on code is written to be understood based on indentation. So here, if we have an if statement, the value or the performance that we want it to do after it's identified the truth statement is contained indented beneath it. So after our colon, indented on the next line is code to run. If we wanted it to do more code, we would just continue having it at the same level of indentation. Once we have finished with whatever we want to do as a result of that if statement, once we have finished with that chunk of code, we just remove the indent and we might have a new if statement saying if var2 is greater than var1, print var2. And again, I remove the indentation on the line when I don't want it to happen. By general coding standards, it's usually a good idea to leave one line blank between if statements. In fact, just in general, if your code starts to feel cluttered, it's always okay to give it an extra line of space just so that it's easier to read. One of the most important qualities in Python code is that it be easy to read and easy to understand. If you can do it in two lines and it's easier to understand than do it in one line, then do it in two. So we have two conditions defined here. If variable one is greater, we'll print that. If variable two is is greater, we'll print that. There is a third potential circumstance, which is if neither one of these two variables is greater. And in that case, we are going to write a final if statement. And that if is going to be if var2 equals equals var1 print equal. Now, the reason we use two equal signs is that single equal sign in Python is interpreted as a conveyor belt. It takes the information from the right side and stores it in the left double equal sign tells Python not to read it like that, and instead to interpret it the way we would normally read an equal sign, which is to say, are these two the same thing? So you'll often run into an error in Python for an if statement that you can see if I just run this code as it is now. Here you can see we have an invalid syntax. And if we were to run this with the double equal sign, you can see it will now allow us to give input. First number we're gonna give, we'll say is two, 
second number is going to be 5. If it worked correctly, it should print the number 5. And of course it didn't. So now we have to figure out why that happened. So we can look and we can see that we have this series of if statements, but it appears that this var2 that should have gone off, if var2 is greater than var1, but you'll notice that I made a typo in my code. And this is actually a really common typo. When you move your variables around, your signs need to stay in the same place. So you can see here that I switched var2 and var1 on my second line of code. If I wanted this line to be more readable, uh, to be a little bit easier to interpret as I'm running through my code, I would instead use var1 as my first variable each time. So this is a really common bad habit that programmers can get into where they move their variables and signs around at the same time. And it's a little bit of live debugging for you because one of my favorite things to do in a class is actually debug on screen because it turns out programming rarely works right the very first time. So now we have var1, var2, theoretically these signs should work out a little bit better and we can run our code again. Let's see if our logic worked. Give me a number 2, give me a number 5, and now it printed 5. Let's try it with some different numbers. Maybe 87 and 41. Printed 87, and our last check, 2 and 2, and we got equal. We now know that it will successfully print any of these numbers based on logic. So that's how we can deal with the simple concept of Booleans. And now we understand how, if we're dealing with logical controls, the code that is referenced by that control is just indented underneath it. How do we apply that to larger amounts of data, say for lists or dictionaries where we have a ton of information we want to handle? So for example, we might have a list here, which we're going to define as list one, and we're going to say it has the numbers one through nine. And we want to print all of the contents of that list. Now we could do print list one, but we know that that gives us the brackets, that gives us the whole list rather than the individual contents. If we wanted to handle those, what we need to do is create a for loop. In this case, we'll say for num in list one, print num. Now this probably looks pretty familiar based on those if statements we were just looking at. You have your initial statement right at the beginning of the line, which Notepad++ has helpfully made blue for us. Num in this case is a little bit different though, as well as the in statement. What we're actually doing is we're using num as a sort of stand-in variable, a label we can apply to each of these numbers individually. So the first time we go through this loop, num will be one. Then we'll take one out of the box that is that variable and we'll put in two. So num is a variable that is changing its contents each time we run through this loop. And that's sort of at the core of how the for loop works, is you have for some value in something that it is able to represent as individual objects. And that is called an iterable. Often it's a list. Sometimes you might see it as some as a range function, which will return a series of numbers that they can use. The key here is just that it is something that can be iterated against. So in this case, we've got for num in list one. We can define list one as a series of objects inside of the list, we can say that it's just a bunch of smaller variables, and so num is going to be the label we use for those smaller variables. And we can see that in action that's a little bit easier to understand when you actually see it run, and now you can see it prints 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 pretty straightforward. What if we wanted to do something different though? What if we wanted to change what it was printing? What if we said we wanted to print each number times two? Instead of printing each individual number, we actually want to perform a task with it. We want to print the value of that number times two. Now note that we're not actually using an equal sign anywhere and we're not changing the original contents of the list, which we'll be able to see by just getting rid of that indent and typing print list one, which again, just like with the if statement, now that we're out of that indent, it is noted that this for loop doesn't control this code. And so we have this print statement statement at the very end. We can see that if we print num times two and run that code again, it's now two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And then the original list printed out as a single list once more. That's how we actually perform a for loop. We're just using some stand-in variable to represent the contents of some larger set of variables so that we can perform some task using that data. While loops, the third type of logic that we're going to consider in this course, are sort of a combination of the first two, if statements and for loops. The idea of a while loop is that it's going to perform the same task over and over again while a certain statement is true. So for example, we might have some variable that we're going to say is x. So the starting value in x is 0. And we're going to say while x is less than 100, x equals x plus 1. And then we're going to print x. What this while loop is doing is exactly what we saw with the for loop, where it's taking some piece of code, in this case, a value change, and performing it over and over and over and over and over again. And once that value up here is evaluated to be false, that if statement that we were using before, where we're comparing two values to one another, once that becomes false, then we'll exit the while loop, we'll end the indented code section, and we'll move on to whatever the next line might be. And to see what this actually looks like being run, of course, we can 
python3 while.py. And we can see that it just prints the number 100. It starts at zero, it goes until x is not less than 100, and then it prints x. So that's the distinction between while and for loops. For loops operate over some set of data, whereas while loops operate while a specific condition is true. And the last piece of logic we want to consider is actually not new. And it's going to be the last part of this section as well, because it's going to be what allows us to take everything we have learned so far and combine it. And that is a function. Now you'll remember functions from things like print or int, but there's a lot more. And more than that, there are functions that you'll need that aren't already existing somewhere, functions that weren't predefined for you. And the way we go about creating new functions is by using a new keyword called def. And def just indicates to Python that the next variable I give you is actually a function name. So here we don't call it a string because we don't put quotes around it. Instead, we'll say, for example, def add numbers. And then we're going to end in a colon because again, just like with our other keywords, the colon is what indicates the end of the keywords values. So here we have def add numbers and we have parentheses there to indicate again, this is a function. There's nothing in those yet. And that's something that we're gonna look at in just a second. What we want to do with our function that is to add numbers is just to take two numbers and add them together. In this case, we're going to say X plus Y and we want to print the result of that. So the idea the idea of this function is just that it takes two numbers and prints the result of them added together. But we've just realized if we're defining a function, something like print that's supposed to be able to work with any information we give it, how can we represent that? Well, we actually already saw it. We saw it before in our for loops. See, the thing about these for loops is they're represented by this variable right here, that num. And so what we understand is that that's a variable that is being defined differently each time it's used. It's a variable that represents new information for us. And you may remember hearing me use this term argument. And when we're creating a new function, that's how we tell the function what data it should expect. So in this case, that's how we can tell this function it's going to get two variable inputs separated by a comma. One of them, it's going to call x, the other it will call y, and it'll do that in order. So if we've defined our function as add numbers x plus y, and we have print x plus y, we can then do add numbers one, two, as our own defined function, just like we have with print, above which print x plus y, now we can just have add numbers one comma two. And we can see how that works by running the code. And you can see here it printed out the number three. There's one final piece of information to understand in how we logically construct programs before we move on to the final section and put everything together. And that is the fact that not all functions print something out. Some give their responses differently. Some, for example, use return values. You may remember me referring to return values before. Return values are just the output of the black box of a function. So in this case, we might say that our return value is x plus y. Or if we wanted our code to be a little bit easier to read, z equals x plus y and return z. And so now if we run this code, we're not gonna see anything get printed because there's no print statement present. Instead, what we now know is that this function's return value, what happens after it runs is going to be that variable. And we've seen this before with print where we were printing one plus two or we were printing the output of functions before. That's all we're doing here is just taking the return value from add numbers and printing it to our screens. And once again, we have three. So that's the basic way to define a function, the final concept in our logic of programming. So with all of this information that we've accrued over the last six videos where we've identified all of the different variable types and learned about the logic of programming and how we can define functions, we now move into our final section in which we are going to put it all together and actually manipulate information. And in this case, we're going to do it to avoid some paperwork. I'll see you back in section three of Practical Python. So here we are in our final section. In the first two, we learned about different variable types, input, output, and logical flow control of programs. And now we're going to take all of those things and combine them to actually perform operations against data. So far, we figured out how we can handle it and how we can store it and how we can see it, but this is how we actually make changes to it and we make use of the data to perform real tasks. Section three is gonna be all about solving one specific problem. We have been given a huge list of files, 1,000 individual records. Each of these individual records needs to be updated. This is the sort of task you'd often encounter in an office environment, and is exactly the sort of thing that Python is perfect for. So here, if I open up a random one, you can see employee record last update date, January 1, 2019, followed by some junk data that we don't care about. Our actual task is just to go through and update all of these from 2019 to 2020. A very simple, very basic task that if we had to do it by hand, would be 
be absolutely mind-numbing and miserable. We would have to do a thousand individual files changing two characters, it would take our whole day, and it would just be a huge waste. And of course, we wouldn't feel very good about it. So, instead, we're gonna do it with Python. And there are a couple of last things that we have to learn in order to perform this task. One of the most important, and the one we're gonna learn in this video, how to handle files. So, here, I have an employee record already open for looking at, and I have a new script that I'm going to open. And so what I want to do here is just open files and read them and make sure that I get their actual contents. And I can see here that this is what that first file says. So to do that, I'm going to take advantage of functions. And so I'm going to say, here is a new variable, and this variable is called my file. And my file equals open. And open is a Python function that is built in that is designed to open files. And we saw in the last video how we can create arguments for our own functions to take. The open function has exactly the same thing. It has a couple of arguments that it is designed to accept. So the first argument that it's going to accept is going to be the name of our file, which in this case is going to be eid1.txt. And that's in quotes because in this case that is a string. It's not a variable. It is an actual string that we want Python to read as characters. The second argument we're going to give it will also be a string, which in this case is going to be the letter W. Now there are a lot of ways you can open a file in Python. You can open it for writing, which is what we've done here. This will destroy any contents of the file, or you could open it for appending, which will open the file and add anything that you might write to it to the end. What we actually want to do though, right now is just read with the R option. So we're going to say my file and we're going to save it over here in our Python scripts and we're going to say files.py. I'm going to say my file equals open eid1.txt R and then we're going to use a period to reference a function. Now this is going to introduce a concept called namespaces in Python. And namespaces can get really intimidating, but all they really are are a logical way of organizing variables and functions. So if I have this thing, my file here, and my file is a file variable, there are going to be a lot of functions, a lot of specific processes of code that would only apply to this variable, where it wouldn't really make sense if we had to give it as an argument for read my file. We don't need to keep having these separate functions that we pass it to. Instead, it can have sub functions or methods. These methods are referenced by using a period and then the name of the function. So the read function is really just like any other function we've seen before. It performs some task. In this case, what it's actually going to do is it's going to read the text from that file variable we've created and give it to us as a string output. So we don't have to get really wrapped up in this. We don't have to get really freaked out about the idea of namespaces and referencing functions with a period. All that's actually happening right now is we're saying that read the function read is something that is only applied to the variable my file. And if we wanted to see what other things we might apply to it, we can look at how we'll do that in a little bit when we're looking at our further research video. But to start out, we've got myfile.read, and we're going to put that into a variable, which we're going to call text, and we're going to print it. So all that's happening here is we're again opening this file in a reading mode, and we're just doing that by passing it two string arguments, nothing fancy happening there. It's going to find the file with the correct file name, and it's going to store that representation of that file in this variable variable that we'll call my file. Once that file variable has been created, the read function is now going to be one of the acceptable methods of that variable, and reading just gets the text out. And as always, the easiest way to understand what's happening in Python is to see it happen on the screen. Once we're in this directory, we're going to run python3 files.py, and we can see that it came up with no such file or directory. The reason for that is we're not actually in the same directory as this eid1.txt. If you look up here at the top, our path changes. So what we can do pretty easily is just find this path name, which is C users JR pair videos, practical Python files, eid1.txt. So we can put that into our file name now and say C users JR pair videos, practical Python files, and there we go. Now you'll note that I'm using two slash marks as I go through this string, and the reason for that is because the single slash is what indicates a special character. So if we have a single slash in a Python string, Python's going to try and interpret that as something used for formatting, something you might use for like a new line or a tab. So we use double slashes to say, nope, we actually just want a regular slash, it's not a special character. Once that's done, we can try and run this code again. And now you can see it successfully opens that file and it prints out our employee record last date and all of the contents of it. So that's the first step of dealing with files, but what if we wanted to create our own? Here we can see above how we opened a file for reading, but what if we just wanted to write a file to put our own data in? We would perform that task very similarly. We would say my file equals open new file.txt, and this time we'll open it with a W, indicating that we're opening it for writing. Then we can do my file.write. And in the same way we addressed the read function earlier, where it's just a sub function or a method of this my file, we can then say that we want to write the specific text, test text here. 
Having done that, my file dot close to indicate we are done with the file. Now, before when I was just reading it, I didn't write close because I had only opened the file for reading mode and it was a very short script. However, anytime you're opening a file, especially when that file is potentially modifiable, you want to make sure that you close it at the end. And by using this close function with no argument for the my file variable, we are now capable of making that file no longer accessed by the program and ensuring that nothing strange happens to it when we exit. So this is just going to open new file.txt, write that text and close it, see if it works. Nothing printed out, which is usually a good sign for us. Now we can just do notepad.exe and we will do file name is new file.txt. And you can see our test text has in fact been inserted. So successfully we have opened and closed and read and written to and from files. That's our basic understanding of file handling and that's all we need going into our next video at our penultimate video all about manipulating data. So here we are. We've understood the basic concepts behind variables, behind logic, behind functions. We know how to open and close files, and we've started to be introduced to the concept of sub-functions or methods. We're starting to get a grasp on all these disparate pieces of programming. But to bring them together and prove that we have real practical understanding, we have one last task to perform. We need to take all 1,000 of these documents and properly update the date. We want that 2019 to say 2020. So how are we gonna go about it? Well, first, obviously, we're gonna need to know what documents we're about to reference. So we'll probably want to create a doc list. And that can be empty for now. We'll add some information to it in a little bit. And we're gonna call this update.py. So now with update.py, we have an empty list called doc list. And we need to fill that list with the list of documents. Now we can see that the names of the documents are just EID followed by that employee's ID number. We have a thousand of those, so it's going to be the numbers one through a thousand. Now we've seen for loops before, and if you actually did the exercise, you'll have used ranges before. So we'll say for I in range 1000, and what this is doing is using that range 1000 as an iterable. So it's going to substitute that I character for each number in the range from zero to 1000, non-inclusive. So it's worth noting that since we start at one and we're going up through 1000, we actually need to start at one here. So range one through 1001 to get all of the file names that we're looking for. And then we're going to say doc list dot append, which is another subfunction that only works for list and string variables. And what this does is it adds a new item to the very end. So in this case, what we're going to append to the end of our list is going to be EID plus the string representation of I, because remember that we're combining strings and numbers. And to do that, we need to represent the numbers as string plus dot TXT. And we're going to create our list from there. So now we'll know that doc list contains a thousand different file names and we could print them out to test. But for now, we're just going to trust it and keep rolling. So for doc list, we have now filled it with all of the files we're trying to track. So what we have to do is open those files and make our modification. So we can do another for loop for that. We might say for doc in doc list f equals open doc. This time it's not going to be in quote because rather than passing it as a string, we're now passing the variable that is containing the string as we've seen before in other arguments. And rather than using write, we're of course going to be reopening this as read. However, because we're going to be making changes, we don't want to destroy it so we're not using write, but we are going to be making changes to it. We're going to open with R+, which indicates reading and edit. So the file will now not be destroyed when we first open it, and we'll be able to mess with it as the variable f. Next thing that we want to do is f.read line. Now, f.read lines is another method of file variables that reads the individual lines of text in as a list. So we'll call this lines list. And so what's happening here is we're using these concepts that we've applied before and just kind of combining them one step at a time. So before we go sprinting down to the end, let's look at what we've written so far. We have a simple loop that's going to go over the numbers from one to 1001, but it's not going to end at 1001. It's a non-inclusive range, so it ends at 1000. And for each of those, we are going to add a new string to our document list. And that string is going to be EID plus that number dot TXT, which we can see is the format for the file names in our folder. Now there's going to be one more step that we have to do to that string and we'll do it here in just a minute. But our next loop is we go through that loop of documents and we open them specifically in reading and editing mode. And we then read all of the lines in as a list. And we know that what we want to do is we want to remove the first line, which is this employee record last update January 1, 2019. And we want to replace it with the same line ending in 2020. Oh, didn't mean to remove that. So now what we might do is lines list zero. Now, if you are unfamiliar 
with this indexing, that's okay. It means you didn't do your list exercises, but that's all right. This is the same thing we were doing with dictionaries before, where we were mapping a specific key to its value. But what's happening here is that because lists don't have keys, the key that we're referencing is the index position or just its position in the list. So the zero represents the first item in the list because in programming, we index from zero. And so it represents the very first item in that list, which in this case is going to be the very first line we read from our document. Thanks to Notepad++, we can see it's split up into only two full lines, one of which is our record update date, the other is our junk data. And so we understand that this is something we'll be able to address overwrite because we've addressed the specific location in the list and we're using this equal sign conveyor belt to replace it. Once all that's done, we're gonna use another method of files. This is the seek method. And what seek actually does is lets you search out a specific position in that file. So same way this zero up here is the index in the list. This zero right here is the location in the file indicating the very beginning. Then I have a new for loop for line in lines list f dot write line. And what we're going to get here, one last note that's going to be an important note since we're writing it into a file, we need to add a new line character. And what we'll have here is now we have this lines list replaced with our first line 2020 being written one line at a time into our file. Once all of that is done, we're going to unindent one to do f dot close, and then we're going to end our loop. So if that has all been performed correctly, we should be able to tell because any one of those files will have the correct updated date on it. Now it's worth noting that this seems like a much more complicated task than what we've been doing so far. All of a sudden we have all these sub functions and it looks much more like programming than it did in our last video. But the key to pay attention to here is that we're not actually applying anything new. We're just going down the list. We're looking for the methods or the sub functions that are applicable to this specific task, which for files we're getting for free, but for other libraries, we'll soon learn how to research. And then we're just addressing specific pieces of information that we already know how to address using for loops and using lists. Nothing really crazy is happening here, even though the result is going to be a whole bunch of work saved. Now, I just wrote this code directly live on screen and we're gonna go ahead and run it against our targets here in just one second. But first I mentioned there was one last thing we needed to do to that string. And what we need to do to that string is get the correct path on it. You may remember from our file video that we ran into an issue with trying to open these because we weren't in the right place. So now I am again going to perform my special character removal with these double slashes to make sure that it doesn't interpret anything wrong. Once that's done, I'll save this file, run cmd.exe, and then I am going to very simply run python3 update.py. And if it works, all of those files will change, and if it doesn't, we'll figure out why. And here we can see we ran into our issue, no such file or directory, eid1000.txt. And I bet the reason for that is because I was incorrect about our file starting index, which in fact is zero rather than one. So I made that mistake and that's totally okay because the great news is after we've performed this hard task with programming where we've gotten our indexes wrong because I indexed from one instead of zero like a chump, now we can open up any other file and see if it worked. And sure enough, we can see that now all of them are marked to 2020 and all we have to do is pick up the spare. Now, of course, if we wanted to fix our code to edit that, just so that you understand what actually went wrong there, when these files were created, they were created using a range 1000 instead of a 1 to 1001. So despite the fact that this EID1 file I had open here made it seem as though the first file was EID1, it was in fact EID0 because programmers index from zero. That is an example of what we in programming call an off by one error, and it is by far the most common error that you'll find in for loops. So that's what it looks like. That's the effect of it, and that's the easiest way to solve it. But that's also important to note that when you're writing code, it's not necessarily important that it be absolutely flawless on the first try. When we're creating these Python scripts to solve these problems for us. It's more about getting the hard task done and we can refine our approach as we come back. That's really all there is. If you've watched the videos up to now and done the exercises up to now, hopefully you feel very comfortable with strings, numbers, lists, and dictionaries, using logic, using functions, and of course, applying all of those things together. In our next and final video for this course, we are going to talk about a subject near and dear to my heart, which is continued study and how you can take these basic principles and apply them into a life of lifelong learning with Python. So we've learned how to deal with different types of variables in Python, we've learned how to apply logic and create functions, and we've learned how to use these concepts to actually perform real tasks in our day-to-day -day lives. 
But what if we wanted to do something that wasn't so readily accessible, so easily built into Python? How might we go about performing such a task? In Python, you do so by making use of the incredible resource that are the Python libraries. So, for example, in this video, we want to use the random library. And what we want to do is we want to import that library so that we can use its contents to perform some tasks. So a Python library is really just a Python file full of functions and variables and tasks and processes capable of performing specific goals. So all it really is is just a bunch of code and variables intended to accomplish specific tasks and get rid of the hard work of writing it yourself. In this case, what I want to do is create a really simple dice rolling application. So I might, with my imported random, use random.randint. Now you may remember, as I was talking about in our previous videos, the concept of subfunctions or methods, as they are generally known in object-oriented programming, which are functions that are specifically applied to one object, and the data that they use comes from that object, and the functions they perform are for that object. In this case, when we're talking about libraries, what these subfunctions are are actually all of the functions or variables that are described in that library. This is how we address them. So if we wanted to use the randint function out of the random library, we import the random library, and then we address it the same way we would with a method for a function. If, on the other hand, we just wanted to use only that function, we might say from random import randint, so that now we can just say randint. That methodology is fine when you want to import one or two functions or one or two variables from a library, but when you're trying to import a very large number, it's generally preferable to either do from random import star, if that's the only or one of a very small number of libraries you'll be using, or the most proper method is import random so that you have access to this library's contents but you don't have to get in the way of those namespaces and when i say namespaces for example if i were to from random import star and do rand int i can now address that function directly but if i were in my own code to create a new rand int function that would now overwrite and any time my python code tried to run the rand int function it would find this one rather than the original which is why in python it is generally best just to import the whole library and address from there so having imported our random library, I want to print random.randint1,6. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to pass the two arguments, the number one and the number six, to the random integer function, which is going to select a number between one and six and provide it to us. And the way that works with randomness under the hood is very complicated and takes advantage of a lot of really complex ideas behind randomness and cryptography and how we can generate it. None of that's really important here, other than to know if we're writing a basic Python script, the random randint is random enough for what we need. We save it, we run it, and it's generated a 1, then a 4, then a 2, then a 1, 3, etc. So that's all we needed to do to make use of this function from another library. But surely there are more substantive, more substantial libraries and more substantial functions than just randint 1 through 6. And to get to those, we return back to our old friend, python.org, where we're going to look again in their documentation. I clicked in the very first video when we were talking about downloading Python on the library reference. And this is what that was about. All of these libraries that you see listed here are different collections of functions and variables that Python can use to handle specific file types or to do certain tasks or to create multi-threaded programs that can run multiple tasks at the same time, to communicate across the network, to deal with specific kinds of structured data. All sorts of libraries exist in Python and the list goes on and on. And by the way, this is not at all an exhaustive list. And so most of the time when you're seeing some really complicated Python program that's performing this huge task, it's referring to tons of different libraries, and it's using all of these different toolkits to accomplish its goals. And so if we wanted to do that, if we wanted to, say for example, make use of the string library, a very commonly used library, we can see that there are a bunch of specific constants or variables as they're generally referred to in programming. These constants, string.ascii letters, the concatenation of ASCII lowercase and ASCII uppercase constants described below. Uh, the distinction here between constants and regular variables is that constants are variables which are not designed to change. Python doesn't really have a great concept of that, uh, so it's pretty easy to mess up, but that is the design behind it. So here you can see the ASCII lowercase variable, or the ASCII lowercase constant, is just A through Z lowercase. 
Punctuation is all of our punctuated characters, and now we can see below we have some specific functions. These again are called methods, and we're not going to dig too far into how all of these work, but the key thing behind them is that all of them can be understood by the same mechanisms that we've been defining earlier. We can see that this format function takes two arguments, and we can see that it, what it is actually performing if we were to actually click on the stir format here. We can see what it's actually performing by reading what the output of the code looks like, and we can use that sort of practical understanding we have to gain a better understanding of this library that we've never seen. Now, all of these libraries have their own help documentation built into them, their own examples that make them easier to use and understand, but all of them are also great places for you to try and find your own programs that you might need to use or different tools you might need to implement to accomplish your goals will be found across all of these libraries. And so when you're looking to perform a specific task, what you're really doing is hunting for the right tool in your box. And that's what these libraries are all about, is finding the right tool and understanding how to use it. Which, not too coincidentally, has in fact been the goal of this entire course. Because as you look back up to those libraries that we were referencing earlier in the help documentation, one of the most fascinating and useful things about Python is that on these simple principles, it has constructed an entire world of new capabilities. It's capable of powering games, enterprises, governments, operating systems, all because people took these basic concepts of logic and applied them in new and innovative ways. And that, hopefully, is what you are prepared to start doing now. After completing this course and going through all of the exercises and getting the introductions that you need to the concepts behind practical Python programming, you can take it and combine it together in order to accomplish real goals in your day-to-day -day life. And anytime you run into a problem that you don't know what to do, you now know where to look and where to find a tool that might help you accomplish it. Of course, there's a ton of information about Python still out there, and you could keep learning about it. I have been a Python programmer now for a decade, and there is still much more to keep learning. The key thing about it is that so long as you have the basics understood, everything else after that, you can learn how to handle. Thank you all for watching. This has been Practical Python with Joe Perry. Check out some of my later courses that are coming up here on Udemy, including Strategic Cybersecurity Foundations and my Python series on practical Python topics. Topics specifically sent in by users like you who take this class and like the hands-on focus of it. If you found this an easier way to learn, I hope that you'll send us some questions or some suggestions for new videos that you would like to learn new Python or cybersecurity skills in. And thank you again for joining me in Practical Python with Joe Perry.